Morning, church. Morning. Morning, everyone. It's good to be back in the house of the Lord and study His Word again. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Father God in heaven, we thank You for this time that You could be with us, O oh God, and allow Your words, O oh Lord, to be delivered, O oh God, this morning. I pray that You will speak to our hearts as we listen to Your words, O oh God. We give You all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So truly, it's a blessing for the last past weeks that we have been studying the life of David. Although it is not an extensive one, but I hope and pray in the future that we will have uh, more time to uh, dig deeper about the life and the story of David. So for now, this is my last sermon on David, which is the last contrast of our series, Crucible. The, changes that, uh, the choices that change your life forever. And our last con- contrast is disappointment versus expectancy. So last Sunday, our text was 2 Samuel chapter 12. But today, we will go back a few chapters, which is chapter 7. Okay, so if you have your Bibles, whether physically or electronically, please open that in that passage. So our message last Sunday reminds us that because of David's sin against God, somehow he has forgotten all the things that God has done for him and to the nation of Israel. However, since he displayed true humility before God in connection to his sins, uh, we we all know his sin, Uh, he committed adultery and uh, murder, So he then realized that he must somehow repay God for everything that he has done. Now look at the the picture at this time. Before, war was still going on. Right? But But then David stayed in his palace that led him into the temptation into committing those sins. God did not say to David, Rest, right? God did not say to David to have a break from war. But now what do we see? In verse 1 of chapter 7, we see that the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies all around. So that states that all wars has ended, though the war of conquest was only described in chapter 8. The Bible scholars believed that this part of the story is placed before the war counts to show its grander value. So this morning, I want to give a spiritual truth which I yearn that all of us will see, all of us will understand this truth in our lives so that we may reflect it and take it into account as people of God. What is the truth? Rest is of the essence. Rest is of the essence. Uh, I think you would agree that this truth is valuable and noteworthy, right? How many of you, you are not resting? I believe we all rest, right? We all sleep, right? It takes a moment of our lives to rest. Why? Because we need it. So that's why it's valuable and noteworthy. In the Bible, we can see even Jesus consistently withdrew from the crowd. Why? For the purpose so that he will have time to pray to his Father in heaven and, of course, a time to rest. Today, I believe everyone or everybody are so occupied with a lot of things, swam with many, you know, many things in their lives. In general, we can say that most of the business of Life that man is undertaking focuses on how to accumulate material wealth. We cannot deny this reality. Right? We all want comfortable life for our family, for ourselves, and to all of us as people, as human beings, we want that. But the thing is that is this. When life is already comfortable, we still want something. Right? And even if you have that comfortable life, 
you know, when, when we experience things in our lives that we want, that we don't want, maybe bad things in our lives, we still continue. And tiringly doing work, you know, every day, and then we got it, right? Then there's a new, new something that we want. But the problem is that we want more. We want more and more. Thus, our desire is to work harder and harder, right? We neglect some, you know, what we call day off. Hope I wish that all of us could get a day off, right? You know, twice a week maybe, yeah. right? <laughs> it's, it's just good. Day off, why? We need day off, right? Uh, to have rest and sleep. Uh, church, listen, whatever our reasons may be and how noble it may seem for acquiring things in our lives, let this be a reminder to all of us. The danger comes in when we succumb or yield to the temptations of having more of this world. I believe as believers of Christ, you must always be aware of that because, remember, the enemy is so you know, deceitful. He's so good at you know, trying to tempt us with a lot of things in our lives. So in our text this morning, it's clear that the Lord gave rest for David from all his war conquests. The question is, do you know how long would a war last at this time? Well, in reality, it depends on the situation and the size of the enemy, right? But uh, we can say that the reign of King David was full of battles and uh, wars. Nonetheless, to answer that question, it's safe to say that it could last for several days and several years. Now, the question is this. I want to ask uh, this morning, why did God allow him to have a rest? Or what's the purpose of the rest? What's the purpose of it? In verse 3, if we're going to read that, it says that the king said to Nathan, the prophet, See, now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells inside tents. You see, the purpose or the reason why God gave David rest it's for that David to see what is important. Yeah, it's true in reality as well. When we are so busy with a lot of things, just work and work and work and work, we tend to forget that rest is also important, right? And other things. But here we can see that God gave David a rest because he wants David to know what is important. I'm assuming... It says there in our text that at this time, the wood cedar is extremely valuable and expensive because this is the kind of material that was being used uh, for the house of King David. In a way, we can say that David, maybe to some of us or many of us, we could say these words, that David lived in a beautiful house, right? But then he said, David said, the ark of God dwells inside tent Curtains. So he was making a comparison. He was making a contrast. And it bothered him. And it troubled him because he lived in a nicer house than the Ark of the Covenant. So we know there's a different David now. Our message today focuses on the desire of David because he has... He has not, you know, he, he has recognized now all the things that God has done for him and to the nation of Israel. Before, he was not recognizing it. But now he is recognizing those things. In other words, we can say that David now is grateful for all God has done for, for them and he wants to do something great for God. So for this reason, David shares his dream to Nathan who affirms his plan. Up to verses, uh, verse 3, I mean, the Bible is silent as to the dream or desire of David. However, we know without saying a, uh, the specific words, he told Nathan that he would build a temple to replace the tabernacle. 
Now, notice this. It was already more than 400 years ago that the Ark of God or the Ark of the Covenant is in the tent meeting or in the tab tabernacle as commanded by Moses. Why? Why, why is this picture? Because this was, this was perfectly suited for the nation of Israel during their time in the wilderness. Why? Because uh, you know, they move constantly. But David is saying now, this is not our situation now. We are now in the promised land. And the Ark of the Covenant was in Jerusalem. These are the words of David. That's why his desire now is to build a temple because it is better and it is appropriate for the ark of God. Church, I believe the desire of David is a noble one. Right? It is a noble one. If his desire before was lusting for a woman, right? But now his heart was so filled with gratitude and concern for God's glory that he wanted to do something special for God. Maybe he was asking himself, what can I do for God? I believe this is also your, sometimes your desire. What can I do for God? No. What can I give? What can I offer to God? Listen, church, I believe this is an eye-opening question for all of us as people of God. In some sense, it should rebuke us or break us as we ask this question. What am I, what am I doing for God? If I will ask you this morning, are you doing something for God? Are you giving something for God? Are you offering something for God? Or are you just, you know, Lord, give it to me. Give everything that I desire, Lord. You know what I mean? Most of, most of the time, we want to ask God to give us something. But we don't say, God, I want to give this to you. Right? I hope this, this message would remind us that everything that we have right now is because of God. It is not because of you. It's not because you're smart or you have this, these things in your lives. It's not. It is because of God. I hope that as you listen to God's message this morning, that you will be prompted and you will be encouraged. To see your life right now, am I giving something for God? I am just always expecting something from God. You see, David recognized, again, that everything he has and what he has become comes from God. And just to name a few things that Yahweh has given him. Yahweh has given him strength to defeat lions and bears. God has given him boldness to defeat Goliath, right? God has, has protected him from his enemies and from King Saul. The best of all, God has forgiven him from all of his sins, right? Church, this man, David, is transitioning his heart to what he can give or offer to God rather than always expecting what God can give or do to him. This is the same message. This is the same challenge that we must see in our lives as people of God. If you will be honest to God this morning and to yourself, you know, are we, are we doing things that display our love for God or love for ourselves? Let me repeat that question. Are we doing things that display our love for God or love for ourselves? The Bible constantly reminds us, and we need to take note of this, that whatever we do, it is always for God's pleasure and glory, not ours or to anybody. Jesus is always the center of our doing and being. I hope that you will always be reminded of that. It's not you, it's not me, it's not other people. It is Jesus. It is, he is always the center of our doing and being. Now let's take a rewind moment, moment in our lives, the time when you ask something from God. I don't know what's, what, what are those things that you have asked God. Maybe a promotion. Maybe a house, a car, maybe. You know, you know, a high-paying job. 
maybe a bo boyfriend or girlfriend, woman of your life, maybe a man of your life. I can say this is crucial. There are times that we are disappointed because the answer that, that we are expecting from God didn't happen, right? The question is, why are we like that? Why are we like that? God has given you a lot of things already. But sometimes you have that tendency, you have that mindset that instead of offering more to God, we are ex expecting more from God. You haven't even given one, or one thing to God. Or maybe you have done some things from God. But can you imagine all the things that God has done for you and for me? To answer that question why sometimes we are like that is because we are basing it on our own desires and plans, not His. Let me ask you this question. Have you honestly asked yourselves, what's your plan, Lord? If you notice your prayers, if you notice your words every time that you come to the Lord in prayer, Lord, this is my plan. I believe that's a wrong start, right? I, need, I mean, you need to ask the right question. Lord, what's your plan? Because we are not following our plan, it is the plan of God. So that's why the question is wrong. When you say, Lord, this is my plan, this is my desire, that's wrong in a way. What's your plan, Lord? Have you asked that? What's your will, Lord? What's your desire, Lord? What steps do I need to take, Lord? Is what I'm thinking, Lord, right now, is it right? Is this the right woman? Is this the right man for me to marry? Have you asked that? I hope you're asking that. I hope you're not only basing you know, your decisions because, oh, she's beautiful. Oh, see, he's so handsome and so macho, you know, and, and he has lots of money, you know, and everything. No, we all know that. That's so basic for, for many of us. Church, God is teaching us, God is reminding us that what we have in this life, it all comes from Him. And it is just right to ask, Lord, what's your plan, what's your desire in my life? You know, there's one passage in the Bible that is being used most of the time, and it is being used out of context. And what is that passage? Psalm 37, verse 4. Delight yourselves in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Why am I saying that it is used, you know, being used out of context? Because even the non-Christians, they're posting it on their Facebook account. They're not even Christians. They don't even understand what's the meaning of those words. You know, to give you a background of this passage, just a short one, the, the context of this is that David is reminding his people, you know, about God. You know, because the people at this time, they are so worried. Their lives are full of, you know, uh, trials maybe, and they worry a lot. That's, that's the background, that's the context of this passage. Now, to understand the word delight, it comes from the, the Hebrew word, root word, which means pleasure and enjoyment. It it suggests, that word suggests that true joy and pleasure can only be found where? In God, not in His blessings. In other words, it's giving true value to the giver of the blessings more than His gifts. Listen, church, if we truly find worth and satis satisfaction in God or in Christ, the Bible says He will give us the longings of our hearts. Right? Do you mean, Pastor, that every time I go to church every Sunday, He will give this and He will give that? What's the answer? No. no. Definitely no. The idea behind this passage, Psalm 37 verse 4, is when we truly delight in the eternal things of God, we start to parallel, you know, we start to parallel 
our desires and will to His. It's not the other way around. But the, but the problem is that we want God, His desire, His will to parallel with our desire. It's not. I hope that you'll be reminded of that. Even we as Christians, we tend to have that thinking that we, we can manipulate God, we can make Him a, you know, a, an ATM machine. You know? No, we cannot. Remember this church, friends, brothers and sisters in the Lord, only Christians that truly delight in the Lord who can really experience you know, the blessings of God. But the problem is this. Even believers, you know why the, the reason why a lot of Christians don't delight in God? I mean, that's possible. I could say if, even though you, know, you, you are consistently attending the worship services Sunday after Sunday, but if you are not really delighting in God, listen to this, you will not receive. Whatever that you are desiring from God. Why are we not desiring God? Well, the obvious answer that I could give is that maybe you don't know God that well. It proves that many of us as Christians, why is this true? that we don't want to delight in God because we don't know Him, it's, it is because that we don't spend time with Him. Church, I believe if you are that kind of Christian, maybe you're not reading your Bible, you're not meditating on the Word of God day and night, maybe you are relying on something else to know the will and desire of God in your life. You know, I think that's, that's not the will of God. It is not right. Let me say the words of Spurgeon, and I quote, Do not think first of the desires of thy heart, but think first of delighting thyself in thy God. If thou hast accepted him as thy Lord, he is thine. So delight in him, and then he will give thee the desires of thy heart. Church, as disciples of Christ, I know I know with all my heart that you desire to follow God at least in some way, right? Which is good. But I could say it is far better if you will say to yourself that you are totally sold out to Him. The problem with a lot of people, a lot of Christians, is that when we take God's Word totally out of the picture, maybe Ignoring some truths in the scriptures. That's the problem. By the way, if you want to claim Psalm 37 verse 4, I believe you must take Matthew 6, 33 first. Now, I will not explain that. Now going back to David in verses 8 to 13 of our text. God affirms David's desire but tells him he is not the one to build the temple. You see, at first, the prophet Nathan, you know, supports the desire of David. But verse 4, it says there, but it happened that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan. So God commanded Nathan to, to say these words for David. Now, if you were David, upon hearing the words from Nathan, how would you feel? You are not the one, David. You are not the one to build my temple. You are not the one. How would you feel? And maybe you will be sad. You may, you may get angry with God, maybe. Uh, you know. Oh God, I want to build you a temple. But God would say, thanks David, but no thanks. Right? Church, Why is the, what is the reason why David is not the one to build the temple? Well, the Bible says in 1 Chronicles 22, 8 to 10, that they, he was a man of war. David was a man of war, and the Lord wanted a man of peace to make the temple. Some Bible scholars have said that 
even for many years, did, David didn't know the exact reason why God didn't allow him to build the temple. But because he is now a man after God's own heart, he accepted all the words of God through the prophet Nathan. I want to make an important note here. Fast forward, we know that the son of David, who is Solomon, he will build the temple, right? Solomon will build the temple. However, let this be a note. It's clear that God is truly the one who will build a lasting legacy for David and the nation of Israel. It may be that Solomon will be the one to build the temple and, you know, other kings may be and so on and so forth. But let this be a reminder for all of us that God is truly the one who will build a lasting legacy for David and to his generations. And I believe that is also true to all of us as people of God. This moment, I want to draw some lessons here that would help us as we apply our conscience, which is disappointment versus expectancy. First, there are some things that we want to offer God but are not permitted from offering. For the right reasons, we want to... We want to do something from God, right? Out of our deepest longing and good intentions for God, we make a vow and we make a promise, promise to God. That's good. There's nothing wrong with that. But as people of God, oftentimes we tend to forget that we cannot do things based on our feelings, based on our emotions, what we think is right, or what suits us. Example, we cannot worship God, you know, in whatever way that we want. You understand? The Old Testament, God has given His people a command on how to worship God, you know. Well, based on the, old, on, you know, on the law, you know, they would offer something to God, right? And we are seeing this truth happening as well. You know, sometimes a lot of people, even Christians, we tend to forget that we cannot do worship in what we know. The Bible was given to all of us so that we will know on what to do. A lot of religions, they do a lot of worship. A lot of cults in the world today, they're doing worship that is not based on the Word of God. Or maybe it is, it is based on the Word of God, but their interpretation is not right. Church, as a general rule, I could say, this is how I think, you know, about this. We can say, think, or act based on our own in all areas of our lives. Totally or ignoring some truths of the words of God. We, as people of God, I believe... We must not operate in this kind of mindset because it is clearly, you know, clearly we can see in the Word of God that God is the one who has set the rules and He is in authority. Let me say this. God is in charge. It is not you. It is not the pastor. It is not the leaders. God is is in charge, and He is in authority. Our job, our response is what? Is to obey. That's the only response that we need to do. Obey God. Well, pastor, that's not fair. Oh, you may say it. You can argue with that, but let me tell you this. Let me ask you, why, why is God saying this? Why is God doing this? I'm in charge, God says. I'm in authority here, God says. He is our Father. He is our Lord. He is our Master. We are all, what? The Bible says we are all slaves. We are God's children. Right? That's the truth. But sometimes we, we change the role. You know why God is doing this? He is saying this to all of us. Because He loves us. Because He wants to protect us from the deception and lies of the enemy and this world that we are living. In short, our Father in Heaven knows, you know this, you hear this most of the time, 
Our Father in heaven knows what is best and what is good for all of us as His people. Do you agree? I don't believe that you agree. Eh? Do, you, do you agree? Amen. Do you agree that God knows what is best and what is right in your life? Amen. That's better. On a personal note and application, let me say this. As parents, we don't give everything to our children, right? Uh, in our uh, devotional this morning, we were talking about this. We don't give everything to our children. We must not allow them to say and do things contrary to the Word of God. Amen? I hope you're doing that, parents. We must not give them all that they want, even if you can afford to buy it. We must tell them that it is not good for them. I believe as wise and loving parents, we should not condone their bad attitudes and actions toward you and above all toward God. I know there are a lot of parents they are like that. I'm not judging, but I'm just basing you know, to what I'm seeing. And I'm, you know, I'm looking at some parents you know, here and abroad, you know, back home in the Philippines. Because they don't want to uh, hurt the feelings of their children, even though what they're doing is not right already. You know what I mean. I'm not being you know, legalistic here. I'm setting, I'm setting a truth here. As parents, if need be, rebuke your children. You say rebuke. Parents, rebuke. You don't want to rebuke. That's okay. <laughs> Punish, you know, and discipline them. Now, let me add. You know, I'm, I'm not saying these words based on my own but based on the Word of God, because the Bible says, we are to rebuke, we need to punish, we need to discipline our children in the way of the Lord. In the way of the Lord. I tell you, I could go on with this, but let me, let me ask the question, why is God reminding us of this truth? Because if we will allow our children to be like this, we will be raising children who will not recognize God and His words. That's why grandparents and parents as well. What's the reminder here? Don't spoil your grandkids. Don't spoil them. Please don't spoil them. I'm not yet a grandparent, but soon I will be. Yeah, maybe 20 years from now. <laughs> I don't know. Or 10 years from now, I don't know, right? I will be. I will be in your position that oh, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to spank my grandkid, you know, I, you know. But it need be, right? If you need to discipline them, you need. Why, if you will not do that, they will become spoiled brats. And that's, that's very basic to understand. I know back home in the Philippines, we have a different style of disciplining our kids. You know, I cannot do my style here in Australia. I, I will be in prison, you know. Uh, you do it secretly. <laughs> okay, you know. Uh, no, it's just a joke. Church, you know what I mean. God desires that we follow His plans, right? Isn't it? it is not our plan. And as parents... You know, we have a big responsibility for our children. We know. We have been there. As parents, we know what has transpired in the past. What are the mistakes, the errors, the failures that we have done? And we don't want them to experience that. The only thing that you can do that is you align yourselves to the desires and wills of God in your life. Second truth that we can notice is that David fully expects God to fulfill his promises. I want to use the passage in 1 Chronicles 28, 2-6. I won't read that. But to give a summary of that text, it is very clear in this passage that David assembled all the people of Israel and made a public charge to 
not only Solomon, but to all the people. David is now passing the torch to his son with an emphasis on the responsibility to build the temple. Now, we all can say, we all, we all believe that what God has said to David and Solomon and to the rest of his people, it came all, you know, it came all you know, to pass. God has promised what he has promised. He has completed all of these things. I believe, as people of God, we can also say that. If God has said this, if God will do this, if God will give this and provide for all of this, disclaim it, because that is God's promise to all of us. Thirdly, the final thing, or the final truth, is that David adjusts his desire to fit God's plan by passionately embracing his role in God's plan. Church, all of us, have been to that place and position which we want to pursue our dreams and not God's dream. That's always a problem. And it will always be the problem. And if you will do that, if you will follow that path, it will, it will lead us to be frustrated and be disappointed. We need to understand that God is the one who has put us where we are right now and that is not an accident. Amen. Amen. Amen? That is not. I mean, hearing the story of Ati Alpha in Alice Springs, if I will ask, answer that question, Lord, why, why have you placed me here? I would say, Lord, you know, at the first place, Lord, don't put me there. <laughs> but that is the will of God. Amen. Because God has a purpose for them. And for all of us. The problem is that if we will not follow the Lord. Because what we are desiring is not God's will and plan. What we want to follow is our plan. And what is our desire. Church. All the things that we have done in the past, present and in the future. Will lead to the fulfillment of God's plan for us. Some. Or many of us are struggling to follow God's desire. Not only that, not only that, that you are struggling, but you, you and I, sometimes we are afraid to submit our longings to God. And we don't need to, you know, uh, we don't need to say, oh, what's the answer with this? I mean, it's very, it's very basic, church. God is not answering your prayers because that is not His desire. That is not His plan for your life. But you keep on saying, Lord, please answer my desire. Please answer my plan. God is saying, that's not my plan. That's not my desire. Why are you so, you know, so stubborn on that? God may say that to all of us. Church, David was like that before. But he stopped and asked God if, you know, Lord... If this is not your dream, this is not your plan, your design in my life, okay, I'll, I'll leave it, Lord. And I'll follow your plan. I will fit, you know, I will obey my life. I, I will give my life to you and obey you. Church, as people of God, why is that inf important for us? Are you intentional when, when, will I, when I will ask you the question uh, about, you know, slowing down? Slowing down to listen to God's, for God's direction. I don't know if that is true in your life. I believe in my life it, that that has not been true. But now I pray by the grace of God that I will always ask God for His will, for His steps, uh, which I need to do. That is the reminder for all of you as people of God. Friends, you follow the steps, you follow the direction of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. And as followers and disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's always our goal. To put it in another, I could say, the purpose of our existence is always aligned to His plans in our lives. Remember, you are not the one who decided to exist in this world. Are you the one? You're not the one. God is the one who decided. 
that you will exist in this world. It is not you. And for this reason, you are to obey God and you are to know His ways, His plans, and His desires in your life. If you are truly a child of God, you will do that. It is not your desire. It is not your plan. If you will be stubborn, you will not be happy and you will not be contented living this life as a Christian. As I conclude the message of God this morning, I want to quote Frederick Wechner. He says this, The place God calls you is where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Nice quote. Are you happy where you are right now? Amen. Amen. Are you happy? It doesn't seem that you're happy. <laughs> are you happy? I hope you are happy. Because if you are not happy, I mean, quoting this, using this quote, I mean, where you are right now, whether you are in Darwin, whether you are in Alice Springs, or whether you are in the Philippines, you will be happy. Amen. Even though there are a lot of, you know, bad things that are happening in your place right now, you will be happy because that is the place where God has placed you. Also remind yourselves, Ephesians 2, verse 10, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to, good, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Let me ask you, what legacy can you live? What legacy can you live? Does it include mentoring someone younger, maybe helping with a project by lending your influence or resources? Best of all, I would like to go back to my illustration a while ago. Pouring into your children or grandchildren. That's your best legacy, I could say. I pray. Ask God to show you where you are supposed to be and how God can use your lives effectively in the kingdom of God. Right from this very moment, you change your prayer, not from, Lord, this is my desire, but, Lord, what's your desire? Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you for your words. Thank you for reminding us of this truth. It's true, O oh God, that we tend to forget that you are the one who placed us. You are the one who put us in this world. We haven't asked you, Lord, to put us here. You are the one. And for this reason, Lord, I pray that you teach us to abide, to follow you. It may seem into our minds that we, you know, we don't like your, your dealings with us. We don't like the place where you have placed us. We don't like our jobs, maybe, and so on and so forth. But Lord... You are the one who called us and you will be the one who will place us, Lord, for you to use us for your glory and for your honor. I pray as your people, help us, Lord, to just obey you with all our being, with everything that we have, Lord. We want to please you. We want to honor you. Thank you for your love. You're reminding us, Lord, of this truth because you love us. You don't want us, Lord, to go astray and follow our dreams and paths that would lead us to frustration, disappointment, and so on and so forth. You are showing this, Lord, and you are reminding all of us, Lord, of these truths. Because you want us, Lord, you want, us, you want our lives, Lord, to be aligned always, always to your plan and to your desire. I pray, Lord, as your people, humbly, Lord, we will accept that. Bless your words into our hearts, in Jesus' name.